Hey, welcome to the Zoot Podcast. This is Chance filling in for Jordan this evening, and uh, the, I'm speaking with uh, Matt Wilson. How are you doing tonight, Matt? Good. How are you, Chance? Good, good. Uh, we're going to be talking about your project. In the meantime, though, before we get into that, if you're listening to us uh, on any platform right now, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you can follow, catch this this show this time every week. 6 p.m. Pacific time, we'll be discussing uh, projects, various projects with with uh, whoever has a campaign going on presently. Um, in the meantime, uh, you can check out zoop.gg to explore the different campaigns that, that are in the works right now and to uh, support those and, and to help get these things funded and help these artists get, get their projects off the ground. So in the meantime, you might see the QR code up there in the corner where you can go directly to Matt's campaign and uh, support him and get him to his goals so we can get this thing funded and off the ground as well. So uh, let's start with uh, Matt. What uh, Tell us about your project. This is uh, the Imposter Syndicate. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so this is a comic I have had the idea for for a really long time. Um, it's something I've been trying to get made since around 2003 uh, when I originally had the idea at, for it as a pitch to Marvel's Epic line, which they relaunched in 2003. That's why I know I've had this idea for that long. Okay. And uh, line. what was that? I never heard of the Epic line. That doesn't, that doesn't ring a bell. Well, so you wouldn't remember the 2003 version for much. The 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 epic line originally in the late 70s early 80s was uh how Marvel published graphic novels and some kind of other books that weren't uh necessarily comics code friendly or they could publish like slightly more mature content through the epic label it was kind of vertigo before vertigo right and right. then then that label went away and uh in 2003 in the last issue of marvel uh then publisher bill jemis introduced uh, epic and the idea of epic that version of epic was they were going to take pitches from anybody uh like totally open submissions Interesting. And so, you know, I read that and I said, I got a pitch. I, I got an idea. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I was, you know, 19. And uh, I sent off this idea, essentially, but with some Marvel characters in it. And, you know, they rejected it. And I think there were only three books that ever published from the Epic line. Uh there was a Crimson Dynamo book, there was Trouble, and there was one other one. But anyway, they, they rejected that, of course. And uh, I then, but I was really like attached to the idea. So I reworked it into a non-Marvel book with kind of like analog or parody characters. Okay. And the idea from the start has always been you know, when you see supervillains in comics or TV cartoons, a lot of times they'll be their their one story will end with them seeming to die. Um, they'll go over a waterfall or yeah, fall fall down a sewer or be in a crashing blimp or something like that, right. and it'll seem like. You know, they died. They they may not find a body, but by all appearances, that they're character defeated. they're they're defeated. They're gone. Right. And then however many months later or a year later, they just come back. They're just back. Uh with no explanation as to how they survived that last thing. Right. Cobra Commander, I think, would be a good example of that. Yeah, exactly. Commander from the old cartoon. Yeah. The the, the I think there's an episode of Batman the animated series where the Joker literally is in a crash flaming blimp and uh you know it's 
and then he just comes back. And yeah, so, he's like, he just keeps coming back. You think he's gone. Exactly. And so <laughs> the idea of imposter syndicate is what if the person who comes back, the person who returns is not that original villain who maybe really did die, but an actor who's been hired to take their place. Interesting. So when the supervillains die or retire or for whatever other reason, they can't keep doing the job of being a supervillain, a shadowy faceless organization finds an actor who is maybe down on their luck and hires them to take over the job of uh, the new version of this villain. Uh, But by all appearances, they're the same person. Okay. Uh, so that's that's the idea of the book. And so in the first issue, our lead character, whose name is John, uh, gets hired to take over the role of uh, like a C-list supervillain named the Bonobo. Well, and so does John, He is he aware? Well, and, and you know, uh, don't spoil too much or anything, <laughs> uh, but is he... Is there like an awareness of like this is this is kind of the hazard of the job that you're getting into that you're basically filling the role of a supervillain and there's going to be some possible consequences with that? Yeah, I mean he knows that much. He because in the world of the book, supervillains and superheroes are real. They they're they're out in the streets fighting each other every day, um, but they're also like the biggest entertainment business in the world. So, so John has been spending the last, you know, several months just portraying a supervillain at kids' birthday parties. Like that's, that's his job lately, even though, you know, before that he had been doing, you know, theater and, and, and maybe slightly more, higher profile tasks. So, so he knows at least kind of generally what the deal is, but he's never been aware of the, the quote unquote real supervillains being hired, hired help, so to speak. So, so he wasn't aware of that part, but I think he knows the risks that, that come with it. So he certainly has some questions about, well, won't I get arrested what about, you know, if I get really injured, all of that kind of stuff. Do I have benefits? Uh, Is there an insurance plan or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's, he, he's very hesitant at first and it takes uh, some convincing to get him to ultimately uh, sign on the dotted line. Okay. So we talked about what, you know, sort of, you know, going back to 2003, when you originally uh, were, were trying to get this this project off the ground, but what overall kind of like over the years, what's inspired you to pursue this project and write this project? Well, it's it's been an idea that I just haven't ever been able to get out of my head. I, I've moved on to other projects. I've done other comics. I've written other books, even other books about supervillains. And this one concept has just like never gotten out of there. Like I've always been a huge fan of the superhero satire. I, I think that is a era that's a, um, there's still stuff to mine from that part of the genre uh like i was the biggest fan of the tick and i loved the kind of like over the top characters that really played on uh different superhero and supervillain archetypes in that comic and on that show absolutely yeah and uh so the tick i would say is one of my key inspirations for for this and i just their character ideas i just can't let go or get rid of and so uh and and i just also love the concept of like you know 
actors replacing super villains and keeping the system going. Like somebody, yeah. somebody's really interested in keeping superheroes and super villains fighting uh, for as long as they can. And to me that I think that that's like, that's a draw for me. Like you know, I think that the initial concept that you described of, of these, you know, super villains who keep coming back and being replaced with actors, that's very interesting. But more than that, like, I would want to know, like, why, like, why is this yeah. such an important, you know, what's, what's going on in the background? Who's pulling the strings with that? And that, that's very alluring to me. And, and the reason I would want to look, read this story. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, ultimately that's the big question uh, that, that the book, if I'm lucky enough to finish the full story, uh, that's that's ultimately what I think is is, you know, the big question uh, that I would be looking to answer uh, by the end of of John's part of it. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, assuming that you did continue on with this story, what what would you like to see? I mean, do you have plans to continue on or and, and what kind of future plans would you envision having? Again, I definitely. Without... I definitely have plans to do more. Um, these first two issues that I'm funding right now uh, are, are in many ways, just kind of the tip of the iceberg, you know, the, the introduction, like the first issue introduces John. And then the second issue really branches out into more characters and more of the world. Um, so I, th I think John's story about, you know, getting into the job and then kind of discovering what it really is about and, and who's pulling the strings uh, could be, you know, 12, 20 issues. I think, I think it's got a pretty defined endpoint. I think mm -hmm. once John finds out who has hired him, who's his, his shady employer employer is, uh, that's the end of John's story. But then I think, okay. you, know, you know, there's a world there that could be explored way, way more. Um, Absolutely. So in my head, kind of what I've got plotted out at this point is, is just the, the story of the bonobo, but there are, there are characters introduced in issue two that I could do probably an entire series about because the, they're funny and interesting enough that I could real. I think I could really mine them for some mm -hmm. some good stories. Story yeah. stuff. Like what comes to mind to me is, and maybe I'm, you know, this might all already be something that you've explored. But like, what is, what are some of the character traits that drive some of these these people to these actors to want to take on this this task? Like, yeah. is it a vain? Are they vain? Are they desperate? or you know what kind of insecurities do they have that sort of thing like yeah there's i think that there's a, a lot to be explored in mind from that definitely um do you uh do you mind if we take a look at at, uh, at some art or some pages here no i don't mind that right, one bit see. okay um and it's uh rodrigo vargas is your is your artist right yeah um rodrigo is incredible we've we've worked on a project together before this, uh, the mini series, everything will be okay, which is kind of a, uh, disaster kind of comic. Um, but this being a superhero book, uh, it's just, it, he's, he's outshone himself with this. I feel like it's, it's really gorgeous. And, uh, I think his art uh, alone is a reason <laughs> to pick this up. It's really, really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really cool. And how did you, you said that you guys had worked together previously. Um, yeah. How did you connect at that point? We connected maybe five or six years ago. Um, he was a listener to uh, the comics podcast that I do, uh, called war rocket ajax uh which chris sims and i host weekly 
and he just kind of emailed me out of the blue uh because at the time for our patreon we were doing uh kind of original art commissions uh sort of digital pinups to send to our uh patreon supporters once a month and uh he he just sort of emailed and said hey if you're ever interested in me doing any art for you i'd like to get my art out there some more and i you know i said that's great how about if we worked on a comic together and uh that's how we got together to do everything will be okay and as soon as we were done with everything will be okay i pitched him this book because it's one i had you know been trying to get off the ground for like I said, I, you know, at the time it had been 15 years probably. Uh, Cause I had, tr- you know, over that time I had tried to connect with artists and, and make it happen and, and just different circumstances got in the way mm-hmm. um, either, you know, time got away from us or I, I couldn't get together the, the money to pay for page rates or, or whatever. Sure. And so uh, now that there's something like Zoop, uh, I can actually make sure that Rodrigo gets paid what he deserves for that amazing art and sure. uh, and, and make the book happen at the same time. So it, yeah, it seemed like the right time to finally make it happen. Sure. Yeah, it's kind of funny how the stars will kind of just align like that. Um, yeah. And uh, I should have mentioned too, uh, if you if if folks want to uh, interact with the chat um, and and chat live with us, just uh, comment on any of the the platforms that I mentioned before, and it'll show up here. Uh, so Benjamin, it actually Benjamin Morse who mentioned uh, art and colors are amazing here. So uh, gives props to Rodrigo as well. Oh, very cool. Um, so you'd mentioned uh, um, being able to fund this project properly with the the help of Zoop. What is, has been your experience with crowdfunding? It sounds like it's you know been pretty good so far. Um, can you speak on that and, and how that's worked out for you? Yeah, I th- this is my third comics crowdfunding project. Um, I, I also crowdfunded a podcast-related project a few years ago, but... This is the third for comics. The first one was just a collection of a comic that had already been published. And then the second one was our self-published version of Everything Will Be Okay before it got picked up by Caliber Comics. And both of those first two comics projects were Kickstarters. And they were successful, and, and I'm proud of it and proud of them and proud of how they turned out. But uh, after each one, I kind of needed some downtime uh, Mm -hmm. afterward because there's just so much uh, work as, as the person running the, you know, running the pod project uh, that's there. Like, you know, I'm the writer of the book. I'm also kind of the editor of the book. I'm pulling together the creative team and making sure, uh, you know, we hit various deadlines and I'm also customer service and shipping manager and, uh, warehouse. I, you know, all the books are in my office here, uh, sitting in boxes and all of that. Uh, and so it can be a lot to do all those jobs. Uh, and, you know, Zoop having some options to sort of help handle some of those various jobs that aren't just the creative part uh, was and is very appealing to me. So uh, I, I thought it was, it, it would help me out a lot to, uh, to work, work with Zoop on this one uh, to, to, help me focus a little more on just just the creative which is the part I really really want to do yeah and that's that's so good to hear um, for independent artists and 
artists creating independent projects like that. That's really great. Um, so you, you mentioned your podcast previously, and yep. I think a dead giveaway is your audio is really good and you've got really <laughs> cool, some good there. I see. So, um, uh, war rocket Ajax, is that right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the comics podcast. It, uh, goes up every Monday at noon okay. Eastern. And, uh, I, I do a few more too. Uh, another one with Chris is called Movie Fighters. That's a really original idea for a podcast where we uh, watch a movie and talk about it for a while. Uh, and then within Movie Fighters, we do uh, like a snacks review show. And then okay. I also do a podcast with uh, Benito Serino and Erica Henderson, who is the artist of the alternate cover of imposter syndicate oh, uh, cool. about uh, the, uh, the Chucky TV show. We, we talk about every episode of the Chucky TV show on that show. That's, cool. that's called friends till the end. How, how many seasons are, are they into that? Just two. Uh, okay. We're, we're between seasons two and three. Okay. So in between seasons, we watch a movie every month. That's kind of sort of Chucky related. Okay. Uh, we just did Megan. We just did a Megan episode. I want to see that. It, it yeah. looks like it's, it's it's been pretty well well reviewed. I was actually just listening this afternoon. I was listening to a a, a movie review podcast about the Leprechaun. So kind of in that same vein. So yeah. yeah. Um. So what uh what sort of what got you into comics? As a you know just a comics fan and a and yeah. a creative yourself. Uh, I've been a comics fan as long as I can read, uh, I think. I kind of got into it because of my brother. Um, my brother was a big-time collector. He he was kind of part of the collector's market of the late 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. So he was buying a lot of the kind of um, big number ones and big milestone issues of the time. He was buying like a lot of X-Men number one and Spider-Man number one and death, uh, of Superman. death of Superman, uh, nightfall, like all the big event stuff. And then right. kind of like the early image comics too. And because he was into comics and he would go to our local comic shop, I would go with him and kind of just buy random issues uh, like, I don't think I collected a full story arc until I was until much later, until I was in my teens, my mid teens, probably. But I really wanted to uh, just buy issues that I thought looked cool and had cool characters in them. And uh, I ended up getting, you know, comics as gifts from my parents. Uh, and uh, I was just kind of really immersed in them when I was really young. And then I took a break from them for a few years because I didn't have any way to buy them anymore. Because mm -hmm. my brother, my brother was is a good bit older than me, and so he went off to college when I was uh, eleven or twelve. And so I spent a few years not having a way to buy comics. And then when I got back into my mid-teens, I could actually go to the comic shop myself, and I started buying, you know, whole runs. And that's when I started noticing writers' names and, and creators' names. And I realized which comic book writers I really liked and whose stories I really clicked with. And I think it was at that point that I started to think, oh, I could be, I could do that. I could do the comic writing part. Because I had tried to draw my own comics when I was really young. And I thought drawing could be something I could do, but I quickly got surpassed by other kids my age and uh, and ended up settling on the writing part being what I wanted to do. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the love of comics came really early and the idea that I could write them uh, came once I sort of dipped back into them in my mid-teens. Yeah. So in what were some of those artists that, that influenced you and stuck out to you the most? Uh, the, the writers who I remember really yeah, yeah. writers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I took note of artists too, for sure. 
but I, I, I sort of really clicked with certain writers who I was like, Oh, I see like their methods of storytelling, their dialogue, the way they build a scene is what I would like to do too. Um, so like Mark Wade and Kurt Busiek were two big ones. Uh, I got really into the Heroes Return books. So after Heroes Reborn, uh, when, you know, the Avengers and Fantastic Four came back and had their like relaunched books, mm -hmm. like the, the Mark Wade Captain America run and Kurt Busiek on both Iron Man and Avengers, I was really, really into those. Uh, and then at some point, I think after reading some wizard magazine, I got into uh, Grant Morrison's JLA. And uh, I, if I had to name three from that time period, from that kind of like late nineties time period, mm -hmm. those are the really big ones. Oh, also JM, JM DeMatteis had my favorite uh, Spider-Man run when he was doing, spectacular spider-man at the time uh so all of those like i really clicked with and kind of got the sense of i'd like to do that yeah that's awesome that's really yeah. cool to hear we're probably about the same age then because it was around that same time period too i was really getting into a lot of that same stuff so and and at that time i was like man i, I nobody reads comics i must be the only one that reads comics so <laughs> yeah yeah so from somewhere somewhere else you know outside of colorado where i was we were kindred spirits in some way and <laughs> so yeah it's cool. weird having having been through the boom period of the early 90s once you got to the late 90s you were kind of in the bust period yeah where it it felt like it was not the cool thing to do but i it's when i got the most into it and was it's the most it. invested <laughs> yeah yeah, no, and I totally agree with you. And and like a lot of people are really hard on that time period, um, like with the art or whatever. And I, I when I look back at that, I have a lot of nostalgia for it because that's like when I was getting into it the most. And maybe it was you know as a kid, you you know more naive that you have you're not as critical maybe. But um, yeah, that was that was pretty pretty important to me for sure. And, and I'm glad it you know it definitely stuck. But um, yeah, well, and you mentioned too about like as as soon as you were able to read, you were reading comics, and I think that that is just a testament too of like a, a medium that maybe doesn't get the credit that's due to it. That you know, if if kids are reading, it doesn't matter what they're reading, and and you know, maybe comics don't get the the sort of accolades they deserve as as like a uh, a, a a medium that's good for you know developing and, and learning and that sort of thing so yeah yeah i remember but, having issues of like suicide squad that i probably shouldn't have had when i was six but i would just reread and reread that one issue to try to understand it and, yeah and try to know who all the characters were and and, uh, and like kind of get the nuances of it. Cause you know, that was a really nuanced comic book and I was a, a, a very small child trying to grasp it all who just mm -hmm. liked, you know, the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. So yep. uh, it, it, it made me kind of dig deep into stories to try to really understand them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, and then that too, like developing critical thinking and yeah. And, Oh, that's that's huge and i also think that our age was kind of at a, at a at an advantage because we had sort of those big tent pole like the superman and then and then uh burton's batman and stuff so we had kind of like those really big inspirations that kind of made you gravitate to you know stuff like suicide squad or other anything really superhero related um and that was kind of like our gateway drug i think and and uh, animated stuff on tv as well so yeah. i think we were like the perfect age for all that absolutely yeah for sure i mean i there were there were definite milestones of like 
if I if I felt myself drifting away from comics or or those kinds of characters, something would pull me back in. Like mm-hmm. uh, Batman, the you know Batman the animated series was a huge one for me, but I also loved the X Men and Spider Man cartoons too. I just I I I got into it all. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I always remember thinking too, like the comics, like the the cartoons and the movies, kind of gave you like a little bit of a uh just a taste of it but when you got into the comics you were you had this privilege of being able to dig so much deeper into these characters and yeah like you said nuances and all right well let's uh let's definitely actually looking at your campaign page here um looks like you're a 7200 out of six thousand dollars that you were looking to raise so that's pretty good news yeah uh we're we're on the way to our first stretch goal uh, That's which awesome. is eight thousand. So, right, uh, right. All, all, all. Everything is is pushing toward that now. Uh, it would be very cool to get there. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to reading this as well. So, um, head over to uh, zoop.gg. Uh, like I said, the um, the QR code is up there in the corner. Help, help Matt reach this goal, um, and uh, get his project funded and. Again, follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, also on YouTube. Uh, stay tuned for every episode uh, Wednesday at 6 o'clock. You can also find previous episodes on iTunes and Spotify, uh, as well as the older uh, live episodes live on, on YouTube and Facebook as well. So uh, thanks again, Matt. Uh, Thank good you. Luck. We will catch you next week. Thank you.